Hello and good morning everyone and welcome to today's, uh, I think it's our third webinar now for the semester. And my name's Jeff, I'm the director here at Insight and uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land of which we gather today and learn and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander joining us online or in the room today. Uh, a very salient topic for Child Protection Week, everybody's business, is the impact of domestic violence in relation to AOD. And it's my great pleasure to have Dr Kathleen Baird, who's from the School of Nursing and Midwifery at Griffith University, and also the Director of Education for Women, Newborns and Children's Health at Gold Coast University Hospital. Uh, Dr Kathleen is here to talk to us about DV and AOD findings from the Queensland Death and Homicide Review Board and shed some light about how this might impact us and our practice and understanding of this really tricky topic area. So without further ado, I'd like to invite to the stage Dr Kathleen Baird. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff, for that nice warm welcome. Um, and um, I also want to acknowledge the traditional owners of um, the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, thank you so much for inviting me along today. I feel very honoured to be your third speaker on um, what is, sounds like a really exciting uh, programme. And I want to thank you all for taking time out of what I'm sure is a busy day uh, to actually come and, and listen to what I've got to say. Um, first and foremost, um, I would like to honour the voices of those who have lost their lives to domestic and family violence and acknowledge that some of the issues we may talk about today and during this presentation may touch some of you on a personal level. So when I was asked to come along and talk to you about this topic, which is huge, um, I found that the presentation has kind of gone into two main areas and one is you know, looking at what is the link between domestic violence and substance use, and uh, what is that connection, and also the findings from the Death Review Board, and what did we find when we actually looked at the report, I'm the Deputy Chair of the Queensland Death uh, Homicide Review Board, and again we looked at some really uh, difficult, complex cases, but we were really able to unpick some of the findings from those deaths, and what we hope is that people will learn from those deaths and they won't have all been in vain. Um, I am a clinician, I'm a midwife by background, very proud midwife um, and um, I feel uh, very honoured to actually be a midwife and, and uh, continue with that, with that role. So what we're hoping, and first of all I just want to say, uh, you know, just spoken to Jeff and he says, I apologise for the word abuse that's throughout the slide, I know now the terminology you will like what we're using is use and not abuse. So I will be taking that back to my colleagues and and, um, and certainly the Death Review Board and uh, so we can acknowledge that. So what I'm hoping to cover in the next sort of 45 minutes and then leave some time for questions is actually explore, explore the context of domestic and family violence. And again, I'm sure some of you already know some of this information that I may talk about, but um, it doesn't do any of us any harm to actually relook at that. What is the link between domestic violence and substance use? And highlight some of the findings from the Queensland Domestic and Family Violence Death Review Board. And then what then does that mean for us in the terms of policy and practice and how do we move forward from that? So again, I just want to acknowledge that some of you in the room or some of you who may be listening um, may have had or had personal experience of family violence. So the emphasis in this session today is really on your professional role. But if you know someone who is, a, who is affected, there is some helpline numbers there. When I think of the statistics, I know that I'm very rarely talking to an audience that hasn't got some people in that audience that's affected by this topic. Okay, so let's start with some of these key statistics. Why is this a problem? Why should we all be aware of this now? Why is this an important factor for health? And, you know, sadly, we still have one to two women a week murdered by a current or an ex-partner in Australia. And within Australia, we know the prevalence of domestic and family violence will affect one in four women. It also affects men, and I want to acknowledge that too. This. Um, it does, it does affect men as well as women, but it is a gendered issue and 90% of victims are women. 
Violence against women and children is estimated to be around 22 billion. That is a huge cost, absolutely a huge cost to our country, with the cost to health alone estimated to be $863 billion. So when I look at Queensland, the cost to the Queensland economy is estimated to be $2.7 billion to $3.2 billion a year, and the cost to Queensland Health uh, is $146 million a year. And as a workplace issue, domestic violence costs employers across Australia around $175 million annually. So, um, and the continuing high prevalence of uh, partner violence and family violence and the significant impact it has on a woman's health and men's health indicates there's a clear need for the health systems to detect and respond appropriately when we look at the cost to health. So what are the health impacts on the family uh, from family, domestic and sexual violence? Well, again, they're absolutely huge. So if I say just from what the poster says, it's not cancer, it's not obesity, it's not car accidents, it's domestic violence, which is a leading contributor to death, disability and ill health in Australian women aged 15 to 44. And the thing about domestic and family violence is it's preventable. We can all do something about it. Um, and so when I think about intimate partner violence being the leading cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide, leading to poor mental and physical health, substance use, poverty and exclusion, it has a huge impact on everything that we do. For example, when women are experiencing domestic and family violence, they're twice as likely to experience depression. And women who are pregnant are at 16% increased risk of giving birth to a low birth weight infant or a premature infant. 42% of women who have experienced physical or sexual violence will sustain physical injuries from the assault. They're almost twice as likely to develop alcohol use, excess alcohol use. And 38% of all murders globally are reported to be committed by an intimate partner. It is important to realise that healthcare may be the first and only point of contact for many victims or survivors, yet the magnitude of the health consequences of domestic and family violence contrasts starkly with its visible, virtual in invisibility within primary healthcare. So we look at the policy de documents. I think in recognition of the effects of domestic and family violence on society in the last five to eight years, several policy documents have been released in relation to domestic and family violence. For instance, the National Domestic Violence Plan, which has been built on an evidence-based new research, and this is becoming more popular as a research area. We're learning more and more all the time. But the plan was developed with extensive consultation with experts and people from the community, and it sets out framework for the um, elimination of domestic violence in Australia. The Queensland Government has also been very responsive to domestic violence for uh, the Not Now, Not Ever report, and I don't know if anybody has read the Not Now, Not Ever report. It has 140 recommendations that we all, all should be committed to. Of those 140 recommendations, 14 are related to health. And many of the recommendations have been implemented, but there's still work to do. However, it's really important to realise that eliminating domestic and family violence cannot be achieved by governments alone. Eliminating family violence requires a commitment to change from everyone. So looking at the response of the healthcare system, why, why have we now said to health this is a really important area for us to work in and be responsive in. And I think for a long time we've dealt with the consequences of domestic and family violence but actually haven't been proactive in the prevention or the support. And we know now from research and from data collected that at least 80% of women who are experienced abuse will seek help from the health services. It's usually from their GP 
And for some women, they may have been visiting their GP for many, many years with non-Pacific complaints. And is it the consequence of domestic violence that makes people unwell? Absolutely. But we still have this stigma of shame that's tied around this issue. So we know that women and men will be very reluctant to disclose about a history of domestic and family violence unless <clears throat> we're brave enough to actually ask them. So some of the women that we spoke to have been visiting their GP for many, many years with stress, eating disorders, not being able to sleep. And really, what was the underlying cause of that? So we know now that GPs are probably seeing up to five women a week who are experiencing domestic and family violence. And they would have been seeing some of those patients for many years, as I said, with depression and anxiety. The stress of abuse can lead to premature labor or even miscarriage. And the pregnancy is a time of great concern where we have two lives at risk, not just one. But we know that doctors often treat the symptoms, often don't ask about the cause, and women often don't or can't tell. We're now starting to collect and some data around hospital trends, and we have some information available now thanks to the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare around what actually is coming through our hospitals. What are we seeing? So some of this data is from 2015 to 16, and we now know from the data they've collected that a family member is reported as a perpetrator in about one quarter of all hospital assaults. So that all the assaults coming through our ED departments, one quarter is uh, due to a family member. On average, eight women are hospitalized every day after being assaulted by a, a partner or a spouse. There's been a general increase in hospital, hospitalization for women assaulted by a partner. So those numbers are going up. And one in 12 women who were hospital hospitalized for injuries due to domestic violence were pregnant. Parents, and this is very pertinent for Child Protection Week, are the most common perpetrators for children who are hospitalised due, due to injuries. So in response to the Not Now, Not Ever report, and I, I'm sure some of you are aware of these um, online modules, but for those who aren't, who aren't, or maybe aren't, I wanted to bring them, flag them to you. So in response to the Not Now, Not Ever report, Queensland Health were asked to develop a tool kit of resources for, for staff and so these tool, the toolkit is now available online and it's two modules and um, very informative, very easy to look at and, and to use and I'd encourage anybody who uh, would like to go on and, and have, a, have a look at those uh, modules. So what is the connection between domestic violence and substance use? Well, there's a big connection, and I'm sure that's not a surprise to anybody who's listening in today. But it's complex, and it should not be reduced to ideas about one causing the other. Domestic violence is about choice, and an abuser makes a choice to perpetrate that violence. Whether it's physical violence or whether it's emotional control, it's all about choice. But we do have some data now that tells us that it, when alcohol and drugs are involved, there is an increased risk. And it's not, you know, um, it wouldn't again surprise any of us to know that in major sporting events, we have an increase in domestic violence reporting rates. And certainly I was um, in the UK when England were in the World Cup, and they had a, an amazing front big page in all the newspapers where they had the England flag, and it was a woman's face with the England flag, the red cross, and a bloody nose. And they were making the link with violence, increase in violence around a sporting event. And that is because we have an increase in alcohol use. So um, many abusers are under the influence of drugs and alcohol while committing crimes, we know that. Um, and, but we also know that alcohol, alcohol has a highest relationship with domestic and aggressive crimes. So there's definitely a, a bit of a, 
uh, more more um, domestic violence crimes committed through alcohol than drug abuse. We, we've measured the, the statistics, and so we know that. Um, and, and that's what the last point says, really, that there is an association between substance use and domestic violence. However, domestic violence offenders are usually unlikely to commit uh, violence when they're under the influence of substance use. And I found that in my own research when I was um, talking to women. They said their partners were much more violent when they'd been drinking alcohol than when they were using drugs. Now, I don't know if that might have changed because we've got the impact of, of the ice e epidemic now, and, I, I, and women are saying that that sometimes makes their partner more violent. But you're experts in this field, and, and you'll probably know much more about that than I do. So, okay, so substance use has been found to co occur in 40 to 60% of domestic violence incidents across a variety of studies. We know that. Women in a, in, who are in an abusive re relationship actually report that they've been coerced into taking alcohol or using drugs by their abusive partner. Um, and whether that's a way of, again, the codependency w with the abusive partner, or women will say anything to avoid more domestic violence, it's just easier. But we also now know that victims actually will um, use drugs and alcohol as a way to escape from the, the violence. Um, so, and that's where, you know, again, this last point, substance abuse and excess alcohol use are more prevalent among women experiencing violence compared to a cohort of women where there's no violence involved in their relationships. So when we look at this, the statistics in Australia around um, alcohol and drug use. Alcohol was involved in 34% of all domestic and family incidents and 29% of all family. So we have the family violence and when we look at family violence we know it plays a huge part in that too. And I think I'd just like to say here that any statistics we're looking at around domestic and family violence will be underreported. This is still an underreported crime. So we'll never really know the true statistics when we're looking at uh, figures. Um, so 13% of domestic family violence and 12% of family violence were drug related. So again, you can see the lower rate where drugs are involved compared to alcohol. And I don't know what, from your personal work what, whether you would agree with that or not. I'd be interested to hear from you at the end. Physical violence occurred at more than 50% of alcohol-related family violence and 50, uh, domestic intimate partner violence and 52% of family violence and at 60% of drug-related incidents. So even though the drug-related the, dr the drug -related violence is lower, it occurs in 60% of all of those crimes. And we know that engaging in heavy, heavy drinking in the past year predicted a greater risk of alcohol-related uh, domestic violence with almost six times greater likelihood of experiencing alcohol-related domestic family violence. And those figures come from the National Drug Law Enforcement Research that was carried out in 216, so they're fairly recent figures. When we look at the police data, and it's really good now because we can call and we can pull on all these different databases to actually get some some of the uh, statistics that we're looking at. So, 2010 to 2015, Queensland Police Service attended a huge amount of domestic and family violence incidents. Three hundred, uh, nearly three hundred, you know, three hundred thirty, over three hundred thirty thousand. Most offenders were male and most victims were female, and that fits in with what, what we know about around this area. Um, and most of the victims and offenders were concentrated in the 18 to 40 year age group. More than a third of the incidents were alcohol related, and 3% of family violence incidents were reported as drug related. So again, we see that lower rate when it's related to, uh, to drugs. 
So I just want to move on now to the findings from the JES Review Board. And again, um, before I begin, I really want to honour the voices of those who have lost their lives to domestic and family violence and extend our sympathies to the loved ones who are left behind. Their lives are changed forever by their loss. And, and our efforts, as in everyone, and certainly the Death Review Board, remain with ensuring that domestic violence deaths do not go unnoticed, unexamined or forgotten. And I also want to acknowledge my, my fellow board members and the Death Review Unit who, who work with this complex and difficult work so that we can all learn and move forward and hopefully improve things. So here we go with the findings of the Death Review Board. So um, the Death Review Unit maintains a database of all the homicides related to domestic or family relationships that have occurred in Queensland from 2006. Um, so this overview will just provide you with a snapshot of the data set from, from those years up to the 1st of February 2018. So during this time, 265 women, men and children have been killed by a family member or a person that, in which they have been with an, in an intimate relationship with. And a further 18 collateral homicides have also been recorded in this period. So a collateral, collateral homicide includes a person who may have been killed intervening in a de domestic um, dispute or a new partner who's been killed by a former partner. And we examined quite a few of those deaths. So there was 149 intimate partner homicides, 116 family homicides and 18 collateral homicides. And you can see in 2014 to 15, we had this peak of the family, up to 19 of family deaths. Um, but that, and again, 16 family deaths in 2007 to 2018. So when I said gender matters, it absolutely does, and we can clearly see this from this slide We're from Queensland. So we had intimate partner murders, um, 119 were female and 30 were male. And again, it was evenly split in family, family homicides, that was 61 were males, 55 were females, and the collateral 17 were males. And that's because several of them were murdered by former partners, and one was female. When we look at the data that we have around um, Aboriginal, Aboriginal Torres Strait Island uh, homicides, we can see when we compare them that the deaths are quite high for the, uh, the population status that we have. So they look low when you compare them, but when you look at the range of the percent three percent of the population they're they're high uh, but i just wanted to um show you the, show you the stats there so when we're collating the information on when the wonderful death review unit who do amazing work are collecting the information we really want to know what are the common risk indicators what are we seeing when we're looking at the, the deaths and so we're using the uh, 40 40 factors that we look at, and this was developed in, in Canada. And because in Australia, we don't have our own way of, of looking at the risk factors. So until we do, we're, we're using the one uh, Canadian one, and, and it's working really well. And you can see the high rate of excessive alcohol and drug use by a perpetrator when you're looking at what are the risk factors, that it's clearly up there at um, 52 percent so when we're looking you know when you've got you know a lot of alcohol and drug use within a family when we looked at all the deaths 52 percent of them were affected by this so it clearly clearly is a big uh, factor when we're looking at homicides so again then, so what did we find when we looked at what was the role of health services when the Death Review Board looked at um, what, what role were we playing? Um, we absolutely, as I said, know the health impacts are substantial, so there's definitely a role to play. And we know that it offers a critical point of access of support to domestic violence victims. 
And often women and um, men will use the health, the health service before they'll use the domestic violence agency. So that's why it's really important that we are, we are proactive in this space. And it was in all but one case considered by the board, the victims and perpetrators had contact with a variety of generalist and specialist services prior to their death. There were missed opportunities when we um, looked at some of the um, cases. And there we have 70% 70 70 uh, either the victim or the perpetrator had contact with health services, which included seeking treatment for their injuries, mental health or drug or suicide or self-harm behaviours. And when we looked at that in detail and we examined all the notes, Domestic violence was hardly mentioned in any of these cases. They had not been screened either as a victim or a perpetrator. Um, and a lot of the perpetrators and victims were, had regular contact with our mental health services. And again, there was no screening tool used to identify them. So, just as what, you know, when we were summarizing all this, the board identified that domestic and family violence was rarely identified <clears throat> by the health services. It uh, wasn't meaningfully responded to, and even in some circumstances where there was compelling indicators that there was domestic and family violence in that relationship. Across the hospitals, across Queensland, the presence of quality policies, procedures and training is inconsistent, and that might explain why we're not seeing this being responded to effectively. And formal risk assessments were often incomplete or not even undertaken. So when we look at substance use, in the review of the cases, the board found there was limited, if any, evidence of effective intervention, counselling or support for substance and dependency issues. And if there was support provided, there was high levels of non-attendance or incompletion of programs um, by the perpetrators or victims. And community service and parole orders had limited success in mandating part participation in community-based treatment programs. And often the options offered did not match the extreme level of, sub of use yeah, yeah, of addiction. So we absolutely acknowledge that sometimes working with someone that has substance use or alcohol use can be complex and difficult. And at no point are we saying that work is not complex. We absolutely know. You probably work in one of the hardest fields to, um, and I want to acknowledge that. But I think it, it is when we have to think about when we're doing this work, then what is the link with domestic and family violence? So the recommendations, the board made several recommendations, but it certainly made a few recommendations in relation to this work. And so one of the recommendations, uh, recommendation six, was that the Queensland Government consider ways to improve two and the availability of priority, priority alcohol and drug treatment places for high risk or vulnerable parents. Because sometimes it was both parents who were engaged in um, alcohol, access alcohol use and, and drug use. And especially parents who have contact with the child protection system. Um, and recommendation seven, the Department of Health implement process, processes for routine mandatory screening for domestic violence within all Queensland health and government funded mental health and alcohol and other drug services. With clear training on the intersection between domestic violence, mental health and substance use. So we, like any work that's complex and difficult, we can't ask staff to do this work if we don't support them to do it. And so what we're saying is for Queensland Health to actually support clinicians to do this work well. Uh, because doing it wrong can actually cause more harm. So what do we need then to do this work? What, what do we know that's needed for safe and effective, sensitive inquiry within all our health services? We certainly need clear protocols, policies and procedures and we need adequate safety planning for, for women 
and for children and for men who are, who are experiencing domestic and family violence, referral pathways and in collaboration with other services. This is not a one agency response. We need to all work together and work effectively and learn how to share information in a safe, appropriate way so we can have a co coordinated, joint up approach. But the screening programme should be well, well developed and well evaluated and evidence based. And it doesn't have to be difficult or complex. And certainly in maternity services, we now ask all women about a history about family violence. But it's, we're not asking midwives to be the experts in domestic violence. What we're asking them to do is be able to ask the question, respond safely and appropriately, but know how to refer on to the experts in this area. We can't all be experts in everything. But we should be able to identify and, knowledge, and acknowledge the risk factors and the signs that there may be family violence going on in this relationship. And sometimes women don't understand why we don't ask. They want us to ask, as I said at the beginning, they often find it difficult to actually come out and say it. And they don't understand when they give, give clinicians all the signs, we still don't ask or acknowledge violence maybe happening in their uh, relationship. So what have we done, you know, what do we need to do to develop a domestic violence framework within every hospital and health service and community service. So what we need frontline professionals trained to recognise, respond and refer safely and appropriately. And that is all of you. It's all of our midwives. It's all of our emergency department staff. Those frontline workers who are dealing with this. We need that integrated response within every health service. Um, and I, I want hospitals and community hospitals and health services and GP surgeries to become known as a safe place. A safe place for victims to go to. But we can't do that without the development of procedures, workplace instructions and clinical guidelines. Those have to be in place before we can do this work. And then we have to improve our electronic information sharing system so that we share information safely. We all have an obligation now to share information around domestic and family violence in a safe way. We have to anchor our practice with research. Those two go hand in hand. And we need to work clever and more smartly with our community services who are the experts in this work. And we need to bring together policy and practice. That is so important. We've got to continue to strive to develop our open trust in relationship. And I know that's part of your work and I know that you do that really well with um, the clients that you work with. Um, we've got to be able to get them to talk about their experiences of domestic violence and substance use. We have to have an inquiry programme within health set settings that's supported by education training integrated response to deliver those services and um, we need to work on building up lines of communication with our other agencies. So what would be my take home message to you all today? While not discounting the importance of perpetrator accountability, addressing a perpetrator's alcohol or substance use has the potential to reduce the incidence and severity of violence and increase the protection for victims. As a dynamic risk factor, substance use lends itself to targeted intervention with the potential to reduce the overall level of risk within a relationship that's characterised by domestic and family violence. And I just want to acknowledge the 42 deaths that we have already lost this year in Australia. Uh, 42 women have been murdered uh, through domestic and family violence. And again, there's my contact details on the slide. If anybody wants any more information after today, I'm really happy to um, stay in contact with anyone. And the helplines are there. Um, and just thank you very much for your time and your um, listening to the presentation today. Thank you. Questions? If anybody wants to ask? Yes, Jim. Thank you very much for that great presentation. I was listening on the radio yesterday about a lady who 
had left a domestic violence um, situation with the children, but because her name was on the lease and her partner had then crashed the house, was on a rental blacklist, and because it was a Department of Housing house, couldn't get one of those either. So that seems to be, um, and, and it stripped her bank accounts as well. So is there anything in place when people are um, fleeing that type of environment that um, the, the system itself doesn't actually perpetuate the violence? Yeah, oh, that's a really good question, thank you. And that's quite a common occurrence. We hear that frequently from women who um, have no sources, resources uh, to money because their uh, partner has taken all the money and say their names on the lease and they're then held accountable for their property. There is um, departments of communities and children are definitely looking at, at that work. And that's why community agencies are really important that we link women and their families in with those community domestic violence agencies because they will work with the woman to actually uh, try and get all that sorted out. Um, uh, but it, yeah, I, I, I wish we could fix it quicker and easier for women because I know it is a massive problem for them. Um, and I hope eventually that we will be able to get that right. But it's often the negotiation between the private landlord and that's what makes it difficult. Uh, um, and so you need someone in to be that interface between the two agencies. And often some of our great um, domestic violence agencies, counsellors, uh, workers, will, will work with, with the women to work with the landlord. But it's all because it's all private. It's often private land, landlords, and that makes it even more complicated. Yeah. But there's no quick solution, fortunately. We've just got to hope the landlord might be sympathetic. Mm. And probably why a whole government approach is good for department yeah. tenants that this stuff is not just with health but all Absolutely. other public government funds. Yeah. You have a question? Yes. Um, you know, for the victims of um, DV, um, most of them have actually, you know, learned um, to adapt, learned helplessness. And they are, you know, quite scared, um, most, you know, to open up and you know, mostly leave the partners who are abusing them. Now, the question is that I work as a GP um, in the community, and we see a lot of this, just like what you actually said. And sometimes I know that this is actually happening, but my patient is actually scared to present. Mm -hmm. So even though I actually give their number, even though, you know, I see them often, I open up a mental health care plan for them, you know, trying to counsel a baby, I think my challenge is, you know, getting them through. Um, so is there anything else that I can actually do for my patients? I don't think, um, again, that's a really good question. And, and we know that most women are murdered when they attempt to leave or have just left. So that is a really dangerous time for women. And often women are the best judge of their safety. They know, they know this. And so it's working with that woman wherever she is at, but also making a safety plan for her and I think telling her there are agencies and so, uh, resources available to, to support her but certainly when when that that's happened to me I often women often just want to be believed and, and it's that in itself is cathartic for some women to actually be able to disclose be believed and be told it's not their fault because they're often told it's their fault and that nobody will believe them so I would say there's four or five key messages you can say around the disclosure. And then I often say to women, what would you like me to do? What, what do you feel you need me to do for you at this time? Because you've got to be really careful that you don't step in and take control because you already have someone doing all of that control. Um, so for me, it's about then saying, well, I can refer you on to these, com the, these community agents who are expert, who will work with you, they will keep you safe. But have you thought about a safety plan? and assess the level of violence, just how much at risk is she? So certainly if I had someone telling me that her partner had attempted to strangle her five times, she's extremely high risk for homicide. We know that now. Um, and actually in Queensland, non-lethal strangulation is a crime. Um, so I think you, you, you certainly sound as if you did the right thing. And again, around children, assessing what is the child protection risk, because we all have that statutory, stat, statutory obligation around child protection. And so when women tell me 
that there's something that concerns me about children, then I do have to tell them that I have to do something with that information because it's children. And our role is to keep children safe um, and women safe too. So I think what women have come back and said is actually at that particular time, it was enough that you believed me, you allowed me to talk, and you offered me some emotional support, and you told me where I could go to and what I could do. And then that gives her that information for her to decide when's the right time for her to leave. And that's why tying her in with a community domestic violence support agency is so important because they will work with her to develop that safety plan and for her to leave safely. Have I answered your question? Thank you. Yes, Joe. Uh, thanks very much for your sobering talk. Um, why is pregnancy a particularly vulnerable time, do you think, for women? Can you give us some ideas? Please? Yes, certainly. So we know in pregnancy, um, often a dynamic dynamics of a relationship changes. And so not every pregnancy is planned or wanted. Um, and sometimes the, when you, we know that when there's an, a relationship that's already under stress, bringing in a newborn baby or the fact that uh, financial difficulties because you know somebody has to give up work to look after the baby or um, may be a factor the woman's body changes so if you have a partner who's controlling and likes uh, the house just right and this does go on for some of us we may not believe it does but it does the house is just right dinner's already on time has a partner that always looks exactly how he wants her to look and we know that for women in early pregnancy there's sickness there's tiredness the woman becomes the center of attention because of the pregnancy and jealous partners don't like that they want the focus to be all on them or they don't want anyone else to pay attention to their partner so when you put all of these factors together it actually does increase the risk of domestic and family violence and there is jealousy towards an un, un, unborn child. And we know that because some of the common areas for injuries are, is the abdomen, the neck and the abdomen. So, um, and they, they see that everything will change when a baby comes into a relationship. And anybody who's brought a newborn baby home and you get sleep deprived and the baby cries and there's breastfeeding and there's jealousy around breastfeeding, is there's a whole ream of factors that just actually may um, increase that risk of domestic and family violence. And I've worked with women in pregnancy who have experienced domestic violence. That's what my PhD was around. And when I spoke to the women, um, they already had elements of violence in the relationship, but it was more economic and control. And the physical violence actually didn't start until pregnancy, but there was already violence there. They just hadn't really recognised it as violence. But it is a risk factor. We know that for one third of all domestic violence, the first incidents will occur during pregnancy. Hence why we do mandatory screening in pregnancy. Thank you again. Uh, just on one, one um concerned there that when I walked in Alice Springs, the women were marching to have a central payment paid into their name, into their account, because the men were usually using the money to, you know, for alcohol or substance mm -hmm. use. Now, have they looked into it a little bit more? Is it easier for the women to have their parental allowance and payment to care for children and themselves easier through the central services in that respect? Or? Um, I know they are definitely been looking at it and, and where they can, that's what that's the preferred option. But you also have to remember in violent relationships, it doesn't really matter where the money's paid into. Um, <coughs> the women will still have to hand that money over to the men um, because of the threat of violence and control. Um, so whatever system we have, right. it will never be perfect, but absolutely it should be going into her account. Um, but you know, again in my research I, I spoke to women that held down really good 
professional uh, positions that are well paid but had no access to those funds. Mm -hmm. They might have gone into their bank account, but their partner had their bank card, didn't allow them to draw any money. And, and one of the first things we do when we work with women is set them up with their own complete bank account um, away from um, access to a partner. But if you have a controlling partner who's threatened, threatened you if you don't hand over your money, then you'll hand over your money. And, and again, some of the women in my PhD actually gave the men the money for drugs because they found the men were much me more mellow when they had drugs, unless it was something like crack cocaine, um, and were happier, and the house was happier. So they would, they, they knew, they, they didn't want to do it, but they made that conscious choice. It's harder not to do it. So they gave their housekeeping over to the male partner to buy drugs or alcohol. And, and I think this work is really complex. And if it was, if we had an easy solution, then we, we, we may have fixed it, but we've still got lots of work to do. And just finally, the toolkit that you mentioned before, is that available only to Queensland Health staff or is it available more broadly? Um, it's available at the moment. Yeah, if people can, ac can actually access the Queensland Health site, then they could access the tools, but it's definitely available to all Queensland Health employees. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, question. Uh, thanks again. Just an international perspective. Is this a problem in the English-speaking world or does it extend? The entire globe. It's a global problem. Um, the World Health Organization uh, have been and continue to do amazing work in this field, and, and that's why the World Health Organization actually has developed some tools for all health professionals to work with um, because it's a global problem. Uh, we're not unique in this country. Our rates actually match the UK rates very closely, very similar. Um, they're probably higher in some other countries, um, and certainly in some African countries, they're higher around how women. This is a gender. This is all, a lot of this is all tied in with gender equality and how women are perceived. So in countries where women are really not perceived the same or equal to men, there are higher rates of domestic and family violence. And in countries where you have gender equality. Um, then you've got lower rates of domestic and family violence. So it's a whole change of attitude, a whole community uh, problem, really, and, and how women have been uh, viewed. Um, uh, the difficulty with some countries where you've got high rates of domestic and family violence is they don't have the resources we have. So they don't have the great domestic and family violence um, agencies working in the community. So they can do this work, but where do we send the women to? So, um, and that might account for, again, for some of the differences that we have. Thank you for the talk, it was very interesting. I've been in the services for a fair few years and um, run across this problem in numerous occasions. I always found that the uh, women were always frightened, I had no place to go, had no resources to back them, uh, if they did try to uh, escape, uh, they were inevitably dumped mm -hmm. uh, and then left to the perpetrator to do with it. You know, you said earlier in the piece that the, gov the governments can't do all this, but they've got to start introducing some sort of consequence. Because at the moment there is no refugees or inadequate refugees for these women to go. Their uh, access to schools by the perpetrator, the police, look the other way, they want to be involved, they get a domestic violence piece of paper and it just lays in the corner somewhere and, and <coughs> reluctantly respond if somebody calls. So we can identify, we can do all the screening, but the bottom line comes in here, where the hell do we go? Yeah, and I absolutely hear what you're saying and certainly the Queensland government is probably in the last <clears throat> five years have committed millions and millions of dollars. We certainly wish that there was more because we certainly need to do more. But if I look at where we've come in the last five years to where we were, we have made progress around more ref more refugees, more, more sources of funding going into DV Connect. Um, you can get emergency 
bed and breakfast accommodation. It's not perfect. I wish it was, but I just think we're also probably hadn't recognised what an issue this was. And women often say they decide to stay because leaving's too difficult. Okay. Leaving's too difficult. And also, they say leaving doesn't mean to say the violence will end. No. And especially when there's children in that relationship and the partner can still have access to the children. And they say, actually, sometimes it's easier to make that decision to stay and have some control than to leave and have no control over it. Um, we are working really hard. I mean, we do have a domestic violence minister now who is committed to improving where we can. And, we, and I, I hear your frustration. And, and I know I work in this field. I work with women. I, I absolutely feel your anxiety around this um, and we've just got to keep lobbying and we've got to keep working and we've got to keep doing what we're doing to improve trying to improve services that we have we definitely have seen more funding going in um, but we've got to make sure that funding has been using used effectively and going to the right places and certainly for Queensland Police, I know that there is a, a lot of training a lot of engagement now with them um, and I, I have seen a big cultural shift within the police and at, at the Gold Coast we have our own domestic violence police task force um, headed up by Mark Hogan who um, I'm doing a great work great job down in the Gold Coast and working with all integrated responses so we're all working together they work with health work with housing and I think that's the way forward is actually more more areas with integrated responses um, so that we can all get together and identify high-risk offenders. The non-lethal strangulation laws are in now. Um, we have a high percentage of men that will go through the court system for non-lethal strangulation. So, but there's more work to be done, absolutely more work to be done. I think we all have lob keep lobbying for uh, more improvements. Thank you, Dr. Kathleen Baird. Please join me in another round of applause.